ranging from a fixed magnification battle sight to reflex sights with the latest power management features. Purpose built and versatile. Find yours at crimsontrace.com. Want to shoot off your mouth? This is the place. It's Gun Talk. Call 866-TALK-GUN. Hey there, Tom Gresham here. It's Gun Talk. We're going to be talking about, well, guns and shooting and ammo and supplies and, yeah, we'll talk politics. Why not? But we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, well, the esoteric stuff, the gun geeky stuff, the, the fun things, because I like going down the rabbit hole on this stuff occasionally. I'm in the process. Let me start off this way. I used to do a, I used to do a lot of reloading or hand loading. Got out of it for a while. I'm in the process of putting it all back together. Went out to Sam's Club and bought one of those big workbenches. That's going to be my loading bench. Got it put together. Got to clear out space and get all my stuff. I was hauling all of my stuff. I was going to say junk, but it's not junk. It's stuff. My reloading gear out from storage and realized that I don't have some of the stuff I need. And frankly, over the years, uh, there's better gear out there than what we used to have. And also, it was a chance for me to go back and, and chat with uh, my buddy Robin about reloading stuff. So he joins us right now, Robin Sharpless from the Reading Reloading Equipment Company. Hey, Robin, how are you? Good, Tom. Very good to speak with you. And I've got a voice back here for getting over our uh, ubiquitous shot show crud so many of us have had. <laughs> Man, I had the SSC, the SHOT Show crud. You did too, huh? <laughs> oh, no, I don't think anybody escapes without it. It just, it's, I don't know what, maybe it's all trade shows, but I know if when we go to the SHOT Show, there's a better than 50% chance you're going to come back with some kind of junk where you're going to be sick and lose your voice and everything else. It takes two weeks to get over. I'm glad you're over it, and I'm glad you're able to talk with me. Uh, first of all, I mean, you ought to at least tell people a little bit about the, the Reading Reloading Company, because that's all you guys do is reloading stuff. Exactly. Reading Reloading Equipment was founded in 1946 in Cortland, New York, which is a little town that's probably more famous for its apple, the Cortland apple, than anything else, uh, about 30 miles south of Syracuse, mm -hmm. and <clears throat> remains in the same town today. Um, next year, 2021, will be 75 years. And, wow. Uh, family-owned, yeah, family-owned, American-made company. Um, We've used all American steel. We use all American machinery, and uh, obviously, all of our all of our workforce is right from around here in town. And I was looking on your website, and it says in the last uh, few years, you've bought several American-made CNC machines to take care of the increase in interest in reloading. Right? Absolutely. You know, so, one of the neat things is. Oh, sorry. No, I just said, what's going on with that? What, what, you're, yeah. you're seeing an increase in interest in reloading. We have always sort of lived uh, – the company for many years was almost considered a niche market company because of its dedication to the bench rest shooters and the uh, international handgun metallic silhouette shooters. So we had always designed a lot of product for the high end of the market. You right. know, so many of our dives, as you're aware of, Tom, have micrometers on top for very precise bullet seating down to one one thousandths. So, you know, we've, we've kind of always gone to that extreme. Well, what's right. happened is it, the market sort of caught up with us. Because as we look at the market in general these days, we look at PRS, we look at so many of the long-range shooting competitions, we look at the mild competitions, et cetera. And, mm. you know, these folks, I'm going to actually back it up a little further than that almost. F-Class and FTR really started a sure. lot of more interest in our company because it was one of those things where you were limited on what you could do with the firearm, but you could develop and work hard to make very, very good ammunition to set yourself apart from other competitors. You know, when you've Obviously. been around this as long as you and I have, it occurs to me what they're really doing is just another form of bench rest shooting, which has been around for 50 years and more. Exactly. What we're looking at now is, you know, how much more precision can we wring out of anything? And I, I, have, a, I have a mantra which I created a number of years ago. Uh, this, the three words that have to do with almost everything with both internal and external ballistics, and that's this idea of identify, quantify, and mitigate. If we can identify a variable, if we can come up with a tool to quantify it, then we can develop a strategy either through technique or technology to mitigate the effect of that variable, i.e., let's make the ammunition as precise and as exactly the same as we can. So now, as we get back to the idea, the only flaw is the nut behind the trigger. What we're really trying for in all of this is consistency, right? 
Absolutely. So we, we have a variety of tools and a variety of measuring devices that allow us to, in some cases, throw away product that we shouldn't be starting with anyway. Um, but that ultimate idea is to build the most consistent, accurate ammunition you have, which is going to improve our accuracy. I mean, we look at so many little pieces of technology, like even bullet jump into the lance. Well, mm -hmm. the reality is cartridge overall length is not bullet jump because the land bearing point on the ogive of each bullet is located in a slightly different place. Right. Well, let me let me explain that. Your bullets are shaped differently. You can have six different 160 grain, seven millimeter bullets, and all of them have different shapes. If you have different bullets from different manufacturers or even from the same manufacturer, uh, different designs, a partition's not the same as a long range Acubon, for instance, that kind of thing. And that what that means is, how far the bullet has to move out of the case before it starts to touch the rifling, the lands and grooves, is different. And when you get into this level of esoterica, of accuracy, the bullet jump matters. So you have to do experiments, Robin, with Correct. bullet seating depth. And you're seating a bullet, you know, a few thousandths deeper or a few thousandths further out, and then you go out and shoot it. And typically what happens is, as this the way with working up loads, you start with a group that's a little bit big, and then as you try these different loads and you've got the different, you get smaller and smaller and smaller, and then it starts getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and you go, okay, where was it at smallest? That's the sweet spot for this particular variable we're working on, on at the time, right? Absolutely. And one of the biggest issues that come into play there, obviously, is vertical straining, because what we're really doing with that bullet jump is we're changing the pressure curve. Ah, yeah, because if you were to, for instance, if you were to jam the bullet up, up against the lands when it starts out, you're going to have a higher pressure because it doesn't have a chance to leap forward. Uh, so Correct. that would be kind of, kind of a, a good example of why you would have a different pressure curve. But those are the kind of things, and we may be talking about changing the size of a group a tenth of an inch. You know, oh, and gosh, while that, yeah. that may not sound like a lot, and it's not a lot at 100 yards, but at 1,600 yards, that's a lot. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because we look at the distance magnifies all flaws because it's, it's simply sure. that, that one's simple physics. And when we look at even very minute changes in velocity, we're going to create a vertical string. I mean, we want to squeeze that scan that standard deviation of the velocity of our group down to the absolute smallest number that we can, because if not, it's going to manifest itself as vertical strings at distance. And again, the longer the distance, the bigger that string becomes. Now, I know that there are people listening right now. Actually, there are probably people who are not listening anymore because they roll their eyes <laughs> and, and they go, you, you guys are weird. You guys are strange. And I would say, Yes, it's true. We are. It is, I mean, guys and gals, because there are you know, a lot of women doing this kind of precision shooting and have been forever, whether it's from bench rest or metallic silhouette or all the rest of it, trying to get the very best out of a rifle you can. And it is all these little things that people say, well, that's just so frustrating. You go, yes, it is, which also means it's so rewarding. Exactly. And, and I'll jump in just a second and tell you that, honestly, a high-quality custom varmint rifle of today would probably outshoot a top-flight bench rest rifle of 30 years ago. Yeah. Because we and, had the advantages on the other side, you know, with better machining and better quality control, better tolerancing, to create far better rifles today than even the custom builders could build years ago. Yeah, I was explaining that to somebody online today, and they were talking about, well, you know, in the old days, Bill Ruger made these great guns. I said, well, yeah, look, he designed great guns. But the reality is, with the machinery we have today, we can build better guns out of the box, just standard guns that shoot better than the custom guns of decades ago. You're exactly right. And, and they're available for stupidly low prices. I mean, you go Absolutely. buy a four hundred dollar Savage or Ruger that out of the box is shooting half inch. You're going with factory ammo. It's crazy. Absolutely. Absolutely. And honestly it's it's you know it's funny, we expect these sort of leaps in technology over on the computer side. You know, the computers get better and faster yeah. and cheaper. 
Same thing's happened on the firearms and ammunition side. We've got levels of quality in firearms today that would have been unheard of 20 or 30 years ago. Um, and, and really, not to beat the 6-5 creed more to death, but that sort of was uh, the convolution of, every, of all of it coming together. And all of a sudden, you go out and buy a, a, good Ruger, a good rifle off the shelf, like a Ruger Precision Rifle. You can put a good piece of optic on top of it, buy high-quality um, factory ammunition, and make 1,000-yard hits, which 10 years ago nobody would have even dreamed of. All right, but I'm gonna get you. Home. Shooter can do that today. Yep, I got you. Hold on just a second, Rob. When we come back, yep. I mean, we've, we've said all of that, and you can buy all that factory stuff. So the question is, why does somebody want to reload? And that's going to be our question. We're talking with uh, Robin Sharpless from the Reading Reloading Equipment Company. It's Reading-Reloading.com. You can go there. You can actually request their current catalog, and they will send you their catalog for free. Very cool. Reading R E D D I N G. Reading-Reloading.com. Eight six six Talk Gun. Are you a reloader? If so, why? Be right back. Since 1994, Crimson Trace has defined and built the laser sighting category through design, innovation, and performance. With an obsession to create best-in-class electro-optics, Crimson Trace now offers a full line of lasers, lights, reflex sights, red dot sights, and rifle scopes for tactical and sport applications. Most Crimson Trace products include free batteries for life, and all scopes are backed by a lifetime warranty. Find yours at your local dealer or at crimsontrace.com. Hi, this is Tom Gresham from Gun Talk. America is losing critical wildlife habitat at a rate of one football field every hour. It's happening on the Louisiana coast, but it's critical to all sportsmen and conservationists. These precious wetlands provide winter habitat for more than 10 million ducks and geese annually, waterfowl that migrate north through dozens of states. Don't shrug it off. Get involved. You can help. Visit vanishingparadise.org. In 2020, Brownells continues its tribute to Eugene Stoner, the legendary designer of the AR-15, AR-180, and more. The What Would Stoner Do 2020 rifle answers the question of what Stoner would have done with modern lightweight materials. Inspired by another Stoner design, Brownells BRN-180 lower receivers help complete firearms optimized for folding stocks or pistol braces. Visit Brownells.com today and pay tribute to one of America's greatest firearm engineers. All right, we're talking reloading with uh, Robin Sharpless from the Reading Reloading Equipment Company. And Robin, I was just thinking about, uh, as I explained during the break, that we've got companies that are actually making specialized brass. And these are, we're not talking about Hornady or Nosser, but like Peterson cartridges, they're making brass. So it's very precise. We have people who are so into this, they'll ha- they'll go buy an $1,800 machine for their reloading outfit just to anneal their cases. That's how Absolutely. far we've gotten into this. Well, you know, it's it's just taking it to that next level. And, Tom, really the, the other reasons that have come along are the, the number of projectiles, the number of new powders that are out there, and really the things that have been opened up. You know, we think of what a cartridge used to do, and now all of a sudden it does so much more because of new de- new designs and projectiles and new powders that allow us to do things that, again, a few years ago weren't even thought of. If you're talking to somebody who's saying, I, that sounds like fun. I have some of these rifles now that are actually capable of this kind of accuracy. How do I make them better? And I've heard that with reloading, I can make ammo that's actually even better than factory ammo. How do you respond to that? Absolutely. Um, Listen, factory ammo today is the best it's ever been. But without sounding pompous, we'd like to think that most of our hardcore Redding guys only buy factory ammo if they can't find the brass. Because they're looking to operate at a level so far beyond that which factory ammo can attain. Um, we're, We're, you know, again, getting back to all those bench rest techniques, many of which have made their way over to the hardcore varmint guy. You know, the long-range long range varmint hunting is a big deal. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously, the longer you can take that prairie dog, you know, it, it's a gratification thing. But, again, that's what our sport's about. It's about making ourselves better as shooters and as, as outdoorsmen. Right. Um, in the target market, obviously, there's there, there are other accolades that come rather than just a little note in the local magazine that says you were able to take, you know, a prairie dog at, so at, at 680 yards or something like that. 
Right. But the reality is we've got the, the ammunition business as it exists in this country today is absolutely wonderful. They do a fabulous job, but they have to live within some limitations. And they're only going to factory load bullets that are going to be, shall we say, the most popular. Yeah. And there are lots of other great bullets out there that may not be popular enough to ever make it into a factory loading, but could provide you with advantages either in what their terminal capabilities are in terms of game mm-hmm. or what they can do in terms of higher ballistic coefficients for long-range target shooting or some other sort of long-range and, competition. And there's something else here I want to throw in, and that is and people will understand this. Each rifle is different, and... A lot of what we do with hand loading, we used to do it by just trying different loads, different factory loads, to see which one would sh- shoot best in our rifle. And we yep. said, well, that one, our rifle, this rifle likes this load, is the way we explained it. What's really going on, to a fair extent, is harmonics. Barrels whip. They, they, they whip like a, a wet piece of spaghetti when you shoot them. You can't see it. The goal is to get the harmonics to be the same so that the barrel whips the same amount as the bullet's coming out, so the bullet goes to the same place. And you do that by fine-tuning the load, by finding a powder it likes, finding a charge weight that it likes, finding a seating depth that it likes, and maybe tweaking how much you push back or don't push back the shoulder and neck tension and all these other things that you can tinker with. And in the end, you have a load that is made for that rifle and no other rifle on the planet. Correct. And it will allow that rifle to do more than you ever thought that it could. That application, I think, personally, because I am a hand loader, is just as important to the serious hunter as it is to the serious target shooter. Because Ah. if we can bring that group size down, if we can make that rifle perform at a much higher level, Mm-hmm. particularly if it's one of those difficult days when it's, you know, when you've got the snow blowing and it's way too cold and it's uncomfortable being out there with you as the, as the shooter are, let's say, potentially somewhat diminished due to the atmospherics. If that rifle shoots a little bit better, you've taken that game cleanly and respectfully. Well, I mean, case in point, if you're shooting at, call it a 400-yard shot, and you shoot a rifle that shoots either 8-inch groups or 4-inch groups, or two-inch Correct. groups at Correct. that distance, a rifle that shoots two-inch groups allows you to have a little more slop on the shooter side of events because it's all cumulative. Whatever the, the rifle accuracy or inaccuracy is, you add in your inaccuracy for the situation, it all adds up. So you, know, you may not be able to control exactly what you're doing on any given day. That's the variable. But if you can make that group smaller, so much the better. Correct. And if we take it that next step into the projectile, We've got some very high-quality, high-BC hunting projectiles that are coming into the market more and more. And what people don't – a lot of people understand about ballistic coefficient is it's not just how fast it gets there or how little energy it loses. It's also – BC has the same kind of effect on crosswind. Oh, in fact, I would would offer that that's – I would offer that's the biggest benefit is the reduced wind drift because you can adjust for drop. That's, That's a known quantity. But the wind is the variable, and if a bullet is affected less by wind, you greatly increase your chance of a hit. Exactly. And so it is interesting that, again, I, I look at the varmint market as, as the biggest one. Like I said, varmint hunters of today are literally loading bench rest quality ammunition of 25 or 30 years ago for their hunts, and they're loading it in the thousands of rounds when they go on sort of one of their prairie dog safaris or whatever. All right, I got, I got to throw this in, though. Here's the deal. We talked about all this esoterica, and it is, and it's fun. But the reality is this stuff is not difficult. I no. mean, reloading no. rifle ammo is, like, easy. You got brass, primer, powder, bullet. You got four components. That's all you got. Exactly. And yep. if you have a good set of quality dies and you have a good procedure that allows you to be right. consistent— you can load good ammo the first time you try it, and now we have all these videos online, so you've got somebody to hold yep. your hand through the process, so it's not, e- not hard to figure it all out. I mean, the reality is, this stuff is really pretty easy to do. It is, and um, for, for, uh, for dads out there, I used to liken it to this. If you, could, if you could sneak into the oven and figure out how to make a box cake, you can hand load because you're doing the same thing. You've got a mm-hmm. series of critical steps. 
you've got to measure, you've got to weigh, and you've got to combine things in the proper sequence of events, and you're all set and done. Sounds good. Well, look, I, I'm, we didn't get, we're out of time here, but yeah, we were going to talk oh. about the 280 AI and it's cool. And if people want to know more about it, you've got a great little deal on uh, information on your website, because if you have the older 280 actually improved before nozzles are made at a factory load, the case dimensions are slightly different and you need to take that into consideration versus the SAMI spec. And I got the new rifle, the new Ruger number one, and with the Sammy specs, so I'll be getting that. And I know I got a set of dies coming from you, and I appreciate that. They're on their way, and I'm jealous. I'd love to get one of those myself. I know it's a, limited, <laughs> it's a fairly limited run. And you so, know, there are more companies, gun companies, bringing out rifles chambered for the 280 Ackley Improved. It's a wonderful cartridge because we've got most of a seven mag in a cartridge that is not belted and operates in a standard long rifle action. And, it, and it's going to have a little bit less uh, recoil because you're not burning quite yep. as much powder. That is correct. So, and, and oh yeah, and oh, you can also, if you got stuck somewhere in a pinch, you can shoot factory 280 ammo in your rifle. Absolutely, that was Ackley's original design concept on all of his, which actually is quite brilliant. It is. So I can go load up to uh, 280 Remington ammo, shoot it in there, and when I do that, I'm also fire forming brass. Robin, thank you Correct. so much. I appreciate it. It's always a pleasure. We, we never have enough time, man. I know. Great talking to you again, my friend. All the best. Take care. <laughs> All right. You take care. Yeah, check it out. Uh, it's uh, reading-reloading.com. And, yeah, there's a lot of esoterica here, but the reality is you can get into it easily. It's pretty simple. You could be making really good ammo right, right off the bat. I mean, it's just, it's just not that difficult. You just have to pay attention to detail. And what happens is you will find, as a lot of us have, that the reloading becomes another hobby to add into your shooting hobby. The two fold together nicely, but it becomes kind of a thing that you like to do as well. Now the challenge is to produce good ammo. Are you a reloader? How'd you get into it? Uh, I'd love to know all about that. 866-TALK-GUN. We'll keep talking. You keep reloading. Here's Tom. That seems appropriate. <laughs> Eight six six Talk Gun. We got people lined up, and we use, you can join us. We have room for you. Just give us a call. Eight six six Talk Gun. Line five. Peter's with us out of South Carolina. Reloading. Peter, talk to me. Good ap good afternoon, Tom. Yeah, you just asked how we got started in reloading. Yeah. And mine was one of the stories of. Uh, maybe a, re a reason you don't often think of, put you in the Wayback Machine going back to about 1972. In college, I bought a Swiss straight-pull Schmidt Rubin rifle in 7.5 by 55. That's a nice... dollars which was a pretty a, good deal. That's a but great then I rifle. Found out that the ammunition was unobtainable. Um, Norma ah. had very expensive ammunition, ammunition, and that was about it. But fortunately, it uses 30 caliber bullets that I bought from Herders, along with my Herders reloading manual at that time. <laughs> and a friend who was a reloader helped me kind of get started with that so I could, uh -huh. could get the old smoke pole shooting after all. The old Herders catalog that we all used to get. Man, I, I hadn't thought of that in a long time. <laughs> it, was, it was a wonderful... You know, that, that and the old... Shotgun news back before we had yes. the internet. Yep. And you would have hundreds of pages of classified ads of treasures. But you always had to get, as soon as it came in the mail, you had to look through it and find what you wanted and call them that day because That's right. everything was gone within a few days. <laughs> now, that Swiss rifle, that straight pull rifle, is a great rifle, by the way. That's a wonderful design. It is amazing, yes. And, and you know, wonderfully well engineered and put together and very accurate um i have read comments that it may not have held up real well in the the rough and tumble of the trenches with the way it's put together i don't know right. but they're they're just and the other thing if you ever look at that cartridge you know it's amazing for a cartridge that's over 100 years old short and fat with a real sharp neck uh, it really at a relatively short I'm sorry, sharp 
angle on the neck and a short right. neck, so that it's really a pretty modern-looking cartridge for being an old cartridge. I, I keep saying there's really nothing new in all this ballistic stuff, because every time they come out with something, this is the hottest, latest. If you go back 100 years, I'll guarantee you somebody did it. That That's just about right. Well, I love your story about, you know, and, and that's a great reason to get into hand loading. If you have a rifle or even a handgun of something that you just can't find factory ammo for, you can make your own ammo. The other part of that, the flip side of that is if you find a rifle in a weird caliber out there and it's sitting on the used rack and it won't sell because it's a weird caliber, if you're a hand loader, you might want to scarf it up because you can probably hand load for it. And you can usually get those pretty inexpensive. Yep, because they're exactly not selling. right. Exactly. Peter, thank you so much. I appreciate you sharing that story. Let's go down to uh, line two. Matt's with us out of Mojave Valley, Arizona. Hey, Matt, reloading. How long have you been doing this? All about 25 plus years. Um, I got started because a friend of mine and I went out shooting and it just became too expensive. And the time frame of me having money, well, I couldn't afford it. So he sold me a press. For mm -hmm. a, a lead turret, and uh, okay. by by the end of that week, I had a thousand rounds, and I was like scared, so I had to go out and shoot that. <laughs> you, that. You, know, I, you know what? And, and a lot of people have done that. You're thinking, "Oh my God, I just got started reloading, and I'm really having fun with the reloading." But oh wow, I got all this ammo. I got to go out and shoot something now. Oh yeah, and now I'm working on 223. It's like I took my mom out shooting today. Mm -hmm. She bought a new 380, but. Um, we found a big old pile of 223 brass, but it's all that military with the ring in the primer pocket. Right. I just take and chamfer that out a little bit with a 3 16th drill bit, and then I use my uh, deburring tool and chamfer that a little more, and them primers go in great. But, um, wait, wait. Well, you, know what, you, huh? you know what? I, I want to I wanna just say something. I, you know what I just love that you just said? You took your mom out shooting today. Oh yeah, she she's she's going to get a carry conceal permit, and we bought her one for, uh, the gift certificate for Christmas, and she's 81 years old, and um, this is oh, her first don't. firearm. She got the Walther PK 380, mm -hmm. and that thing is so sweet for her. And um, but <laughs> this is all a plus plus thing because we found her like 200 cases while we was out there, and she so enjoyed herself. And wow. I'm going to teach her how to shoot the AR, and she's not afraid of it because I showed her how little it kicks by shooting it with one hand. Yeah. But uh, she was tired because we didn't bring a chair, so that's my fault. Well, but she's anyway, 81. you got to bring a chair for your mom when you go out shooting, man. <laughs> I know. That's only respect, isn't it? <laughs> that's right. That's right. Hey, Matt, I've got to scoot. I appreciate the call, sir, and uh, I appreciate that insight. 25 years of reloading. Yeah, it's economical, but it does, in fact, become its own hobby. A lot of people got into it and said, well, I can save money doing this. Okay, here's the dirty little secret on reloading. You will not save money. You will shoot more. Because <laughs> you're going to spend whatever you got, right? But you can make ammo for, mm, you can probably save 40% on the cost of ammo. I mean, maybe not on 9mm and 5.56 five, because you can buy that so cheap. But if you're talking about good ammo, uh, you can probably save 40 or 50% on the cost of ammo. And people say, I'm going to save a lot of money. You're probably, honestly, you're probably just going to shoot more for the same amount of money. And I would call that a big win. More shooting for the same amount. That's just one of the other benefits of reloading. All right, 866-TALK-GUN. Quick break. Come back. we got room for you if you want to join us. Tom Gresham here. Why do hunters and shooters love the Ruger American Rifle? With right-handed and left-handed versions, all-weather, Magnum, Compact, Predator, Ranch, and Scope package options, there's a Ruger American for everyone. Lightweight with an adjustable trigger and minute of angle accuracy, Ruger American Rifles pack in the features. Is the Ruger American the best rifle on the market? See for yourself at your local retailer or at Ruger.com. That's Ruger.com. Since 1937, Ducks Unlimited has led the charge on wetlands and waterfowl conservation.
wetlands reduce the effects of flooding and recharge our drinking water. But perhaps most importantly, they allow us to experience what makes the outdoors so great. Band together to rescue our wetlands. You got your carry permit, and that's good. But you know you could use more training. Get the DVDs, which have what you need. Springfield Armory presents Concealed Carry 1 and Concealed Carry 2 with Bata Group. Learn specific concealed carry skills from Top Gun fighting trainers. Get trained. Be prepared. This really is life and death. ShopGunTalk.com That's ShopGunTalk.com Are you looking for a place to shoot? The National Shooting Sports Foundation has a great website called wheretoshoot.org. It's the largest database of shooting ranges on the Internet. It's also a great resource for shooters where you can find video tips, printable targets, and a lot more. Find it online at wheretoshoot.org. And while you're there, download their free iPhone app. That's wheretoshoot.org. Back with you. Let's go to the phones here. Line three. Brian's with us. Salt Lake City, Utah. Hunting with the 300 blackout. What are you doing over there, Brian? Yeah, sometimes I get to Texas uh, and get to shoot hogs, and this time I thought I'd take my 300 blackout. Okay. Uh, but I haven't, I haven't tried this on hogs yet, and my thought was, you know, usually you shoot the first hog and everybody, they all scatter. Right. Right. I'm, my thought is I put a can on this. Uh, maybe I can get a couple more hogs. Without them all scattering, um, yeah. I can't Are decide you... on the the bullet. I guess I don't know if it's better to go faster, get a lower weight and faster, and not be subsonic or get a subsonic. Anyway, I thought right. of Are you your shoot... Are you hunting at night? Um, both. It'd be day and night. Okay. Uh, first of all, use a can either way, uh, and I would. Reports I get is that the subsonic ammo, you got to go so heavy on the bullet, you're going pretty slow on the velocity. Um, not quite as good a performance. And now there's some really good 110 grain, 120 grain bullets. Uh, the Barnes bullets, uh, they actually have loaded ammo uh, in Barnes ammo with 110 or 120 grain uh, bullets using that TAC, uh, TX bullet of theirs, the, the all copper. They penetrate well, get deep penetration, even though it's a lighter weight bullet. Uh, and you're still going to get a good benefit out of the can, but it will not, as you understand, it's not going to be as quiet. You're going to have that hypersonic or the supersonic crack yeah. out of it. Okay, so that, yep, so that then, that helps. Yeah, I just can't decide if I should go faster. <laughs> it I, seems like all the better bullets for hunting are the lower grain. Yeah, I, I would de I would go with the uh, lighter weight hunting bullets faster. Honestly, you're looking at 200, 250 yard uh, capability with those bullets versus probably 150 yard max with a lot of the subsonic. It's just going so darn slow. Yeah, so. and it's like, yeah, and it's the performance. Like, how does it do when it hits? So perfect. Yep, yep. Well, good luck with what uh, what rifle are you shooting, by the way. It's a uh, it's an AR pistol. Oh, okay. All tricked out. Yeah. So the whole idea is it's, you know, compact, travel with it, fits in a suitcase. Right. Yeah. Well, good deal. That'll be fun. Well, look, good luck with it. Yeah, thank you. All right. Take care. Appreciate the call, sir. Uh, go to Taylor. He's on line four out of uh, Utah. Hey, Taylor, you're on Gun Talk. Hey, I just wanted to give an update on the 20 for 20. Okay. Um, as you know, in Utah, we're having a bunch of laws come down from the legislature that they're trying to put through. And yes. so I wrote both my representatives in the state, and then I also wrote our Senate, our state senator for the U.S. Uh, Senate and the congressman, and right. wrote them that uh, they have my vote as long as they will vote no to any and all gun control. And uh, they actually are having a Gun Save Live event at the Utah Capitol this Thursday. Are you going to be there? I sure am. That is great. Now, have you heard no. back from any of the uh, elected representatives that you uh, wrote? I have not. Um, 
one quick note. The mm-hmm. March for Our Lives was actually at the Capitol yesterday, and they had 75 turnout. So I'm hoping that when we go on Thursday, we'll have a lot more. I bet you will. And uh, now here comes the part where I'm going to lean on you. You can help with that turnout. You just, you know, that 20 and 2020 effort. That also includes contacting all of your friends and everybody you know, and put put it on your Facebook and put it on, you know, every social media, your Instagram and everything else you got, put it out there. Hey, we're going to be there. We're going to have an event. Let's all get together. Let's go have breakfast before, and then we'll go over there. And I mean, you make it a thing and that's how you get a turnout. Yeah, definitely. All right. Well, good uh, Good luck with it. Oh, oh, that's right. You also want, when we're doing, as long as we're doing 20 for 2020, you also got a report on a 20. I I do. Yep. I picked (laughs) up a generation two Glock model 20. And I called Glock to check the serial number, and it was one of the first ones made back in 1991. Okay, 10 millimeter. I know that. In 10 millimeter. And I bought some Underwood uh, full house loads for it, and I'm telling you what, that is a sweet package. That is a, you know, that should have been called a Magnum. The 10 millimeter, when you're using the real loads like those Underwoods, it should have been a Magnum because it really is. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I think they're 220 grain moving at uh, 1,400 foot per second. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's got some kick to it. It does. So what's your plan? Is that like your bear defense gun? Yep, absolutely. It's going to be my camp. Uh, you know, I do a lot of archery hunting, and that's going to be on my side for all that. Perfect. That, uh, that'll do it. Look, great. I appreciate the report. Thank you, sir, and uh, thank you for your uh, advocacy in your work this 20 and 2020. All we're asking is 20 minutes a day from every gun owner to work on this 2020 campaign, and it's Writing your legislators, writing your congressmen, your senators, com, you know, contacting your buddies, making posts on, you know, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, anything else you have, any other social media, getting the word out, showing up, and Taylor's doing all of that. I mean, that's we. You know what? It's really simple. If we do that, we win. If we don't, there's a real good chance we lose. Do not underestimate Bloomberg's billions. It's unbelievable what he can do with that. All righty. So just just a thought for you. Let's do this. I want to drop down to uh, line three. It's uh, Heiko, I believe, is in uh, Carson City, Nevada. Is it Heiko? Yes, sir, Tom. I uh, oh. just wanted to point out, you're talking about reloading. Uh, uh-huh. I remember back a long time ago, uh, after I got out of the Navy, I went ahead and got a 32 Winchester 1894 model. Mm. And the only thing available was the Lyman hand loader. That squeeze for thing that they caliber. had? Was, was that that loader that you squeezed like a big pair of pliers? Oh, he dropped out on us, darn it. I, I think it was, that Lyman hand loader. I also remember, does anybody remember the Lee loader? It was really super cheap, and you got it in this little box. And I think it had like a either a hammer. This is very vague. This goes way, way back. I'm very vague in my head. But it was a Lee loader box, and it had a bunch of little parts in it. And I want to say you had to, like, put a die on top of the case and whack it with a hammer. But I am just trying to remember the, the deal. That if, if you have any memory of that, uh, if you use one of those, I would love to get that feedback as well. Because for a lot of folks, that was the cheapest way to get into reloading. You couldn't make a lot of ammo fast, but you could get into it, and you could make your own ammo with those old Lee loaders. But, uh, yeah, Lyman, you know, one of the things I like to do is go back and look at old loading manuals. But here's your warning on that. Don't use the old loading manuals for current load data. Powders change. Things change. And the burn rate of the powders from 30 years ago, even though the powder may have the same number, may not be the same. You want to get the latest loading data, so get the latest load uh, manuals out there and use the information to concoct, you know, concoct your recipes for your loads out of that. Just kind of a heads up on that. 866-TALK-GUN. This is Gun Talk. You see this? Uh, Michael Bloomberg. At least they're floating the news story, probably a trial balloon. Michael Bloomberg considering Hillary Clinton as his running mate. I don't see that going anywhere. I don't see her willing to settle for number two at all. And all the other reasons that everybody already knows. So (laughs) Uh, Bloomberg is his own little 
thing there. Uh, by the way, if, I've explained this before, but just to remind you, when we talk about him having billions of dollars, being willing to spend a billion dollars on this race and how much that is, I use the example of the difference between a million and a billion seconds. A million seconds is 11 and a half days. A billion seconds is 31 years. So, yes, he can buy all the advertising. All right, let's go. Uh, let's see. Line Ford. It's uh, Tuski is with us out of Tulsa, Oklahoma. How are you, sir? Oh, I didn't want to be on the air. I just called up because I've never voted on the NRA election. Ah, okay. Well, you know what? I've had a lot of people ask me who you know who to vote for, who to vote for on the NRA election. I got two thoughts for you. One is that I'm not sure it's going to make a lot of difference because uh, Wayne and his folks are still running everything, and the board is unwilling or un probably going to be unable to do anything about that. However, having said that. I support Phil Journey, a Judge Phil Journey, and there is a thought out there that what you do is you vote for one person and not for the whole slate, and that loads that person up and helps that person get in. So if you're of a mind to do that, I would say vote for Phil Journey and just send the ballot in that way. Uh, others are definitely going to disagree with me on that. Uh, I'm trying to find people who would say, hey, I'm willing to go in and basically demand that Wayne retire or resign. Nobody's willing to say that, but Phil is a good guy. I've known him a long time. And uh, <clears throat> as a judge, I'm pretty sure he's going to do the right thing when he gets in there, if he gets in there. Let's go talk to uh, Rick on line two out of Garland, Texas. Rick, what's going on here with your granddaughter? Well, she wants to shoot, and uh, the most convenient thing for me is to pull out my BB gun and, and let her, you know, take out some things in the backyard, but she can't cock it by herself, and okay. uh, she can't do the pump one either, and I'm looking for either a more friendly BB gun for a girl like that or mm -hmm. uh, other suggestions. Okay. There are a lot of really good uh, air guns made now, uh, and they've got some cool ones that really look, I mean, SIG, for, you know, you're familiar with SIG Sauer uh, Gun yeah. Company. They have a whole line of air guns now, and okay. they've got some that a lot of them look and feel just like their other guns, but they are CO2 or air-powered, so there's no cocking involved. They're actually even uh, semi-auto, and they just look like fun. Uh, what would happen is I'm, I'm afraid you're going to end up taking that gun back from your granddaughter once you get it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's okay, too. <laughs> uh, there, there's also a website called Pyramid Air, with a Y, P-Y-R-A-M-I-D, Pyramid Air, and they have hundreds of air guns there. And what I think, if, if she can't cock a uh, lever action, I would be looking for a CO2-powered air gun, and then you just keep buying you know, CO2 cartridges and BBs or pellets, and you're good to go. But yeah, check out Pyramid Air, but also go on the Sig Sauer website and look at their air guns. They are really nice and very cool. And, uh, and good for you in getting your granddaughter out there shooting. Yeah, and for everybody out there, take a look. Uh, go to that Sig Sauer uh, website, sigsauer.com. Look at those air guns. You're going to be amazed. They look just like, feel just like their adult regular centerfire guns. And fun, oh my gosh, are those things fun. You can shoot them a lot of different places. Hey, 20 and 2020. I mean, 20 minutes every day for this year. We do all of that, we win. Appreciate it. Thank you so much.